Hello, this is Guru Madhavan, the technology section editor for Evolution, This View of Life, a magazine that approaches anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective. I am delighted to introduce Benjamin James Bush to you today. Uh, he'll be joining the magazine as the new associate editor for the technology section. Benjamin is uh, a PhD candidate at the State University of New York at Binghamton, and he's also a graduate research assistant at uh, the Collective Dynamics of Complex Systems Research Group uh, in the university. His research area is fascinating. Uh, if you just want me to throw a few uh, buzzwords uh, surrounding his research, and they essentially cover evolutionary science, complex systems, network science, and collective decision-making, uh, topics that are all of uh, contemporary importance and uh, value. With that said, uh, I would uh, like to uh, introduce Benjamin to you all again. And uh, uh, Benjamin, welcome aboard. Hi, very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Very good. Well, your background is very fascinating, and I understand you're a mathematician by training. So I'm really curious to uh, understand um, how, um, uh, I mean, about your intellectual journey uh, to this point. Sure. Okay. Well. Um... As an undergraduate, I spent a, a few years undeclared major, and uh, I found it difficult to uh, to find a place that was general enough um, for my interests. I had a lot of different scientific interests, and uh, I, I was finding it difficult to say, "Oh, I want to be a physics major. I want to be a biology major," you know, because uh, I was very concerned about the opportunity cost of closing myself off to other fields. And so I chose mathematics because I saw it as having such broad applicability. Um, I felt that if I did mathematics, it would give me a foundation to further study other things later on in my academic career. That led me to have a bachelor's degree and then a master's degree. And um, at the same time that I was studying mathematics, I was also doing uh, computer science research and evolutionary computation, starting with my undergraduate research advisor, Todd Ebert at California State University, Long Beach, and then again at the master's level at California State University, Los Angeles with Professor Russ Abbott. He was actually the one who recommended a book to me that changed my path. It was uh, Evolution for Everyone by David Sloan Wilson. And uh, I read about the EOS community that he helps run at Binghamton University and also several other institutions. I was very attracted to the community and also the broad level of applicability that he described the EVOS program as studying and looking into and discussing. And I decided I wanted to be part of that. So I emailed him and I said, hey, um, I'm a computer math guy. Is there a place at Binghamton for me? And he recommended me to my current advisor, Dr. Hirogi Sayama, in the Collective Dynamics of Complex Systems Lab. Well, um, David uh, Sloan Wilson has uh, been a uh a powerful influence in my own uh, uh, intellectual construct. His book uh, has been a, a powerful uh, introduction for me to get into evolutionary biology and appreciate the technological aspects uh, relating to evolutionary science and the influence of evolutionary uh, science on technology development, which is something that I'm personally interested in and uh, that explains uh, why I'm involved in the technology section uh, of this uh, magazine. And uh, I completely agree with you. Um, uh, what uh, uh, David Tron Wilson has done is uh, uh, create and foster uh, a community or in a sense a social system and uh, it, uh, it's, it's a fascinating dynamic uh, to uh, look at it and how ideas spread within uh, a system and I understand that uh, your current research focus is all it's about uh, modeling and simulation of uh, uh, such social systems and how ideas get exchanged, how information gets uh, transferred from uh, one medium to uh, another one. So, um, uh, how how do you go about uh, you know even conceptualizing um, uh, such a deeply dynamic system and how ideas uh, are exchanged within social networks and how you know these uh, ideas and relationships within this network change over time? I guess. Well, I consider the evolution of ideas on several different scales of uh, time and space. I study the evolution of ideas within an individual. Within the process of thinking, uh, we manipulate ideas in our own brains, in our own minds. We do things like combine them together to make new ideas, or sometimes we can gradually alter an idea to, to try to improve it, or we can uh, 
uh, weigh ideas against each other and, and try to reconcile them with each other to generate an overall worldview. Assuming that our brain has only so much room for ideas, the ingredients for evolution are there. You have the population of ideas and you've got the variation and, and the selection. You can choose to forget some ideas or retain some over others. And mm -hmm. so just at the level of the individual person, you can have the evolution of ideas. Then I also consider the evolution of ideas within small groups of people. I'm actually developing a, a system along with my colleagues. It's an electronic brainstorming application that allows people to, through an evolutionary system, try to generate new and useful ideas for a specific purpose. It's called Semantistorm, and we're still working on the development. The idea is that in a typical brainstorming session, things tend to go downhill as the most loud person tends to override the entire conversation and, and take over. People tend to have a difficult time getting ideas out there and exchanging ideas with their peers. What we do with the Semantistorm system is we try to optimize the evolvability of ideas at the group level to ensure that the environment in that group continues to be a, a good place for ideas to continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. And then my other research project is exploring the evolution of ideas at a much larger level, at the level of large social systems. That's actually a simulation experiment of a dynamic social network, and the main idea behind that is that whenever people exchange ideas with other people, it can affect the nature of the network that holds mm -hmm. those people together. Right. right. So, f for example, if, um, if I'm strongly opinionated and I go out there and I state my opinion to someone who's also strongly opinionated and disagrees with me, that might hurt my social relationship with that person. Um, on the other hand, if if somebody is inspired by what I say or agrees with me very much, then uh, that can actually help cement our link, make our link with that person even stronger. Yeah, in some degree, there's a spread of influence within a, a community. Right. Yeah. So, that, you know, depending on how ideas are exchanged, you can get the emergence of leaders and communities over right. time. And uh, um, uh, and there's a direct uh, relationship to how public policies are formed um, if we understand how these things work uh, from an evolutionary perspective. So which is um, uh, crucial, I guess, which is something that uh, I do for uh, uh, my living, uh, yeah. working at the intersection of technology and public policy. So I'm frequently um, faced with challenging questions. Um, yeah how influence goes about and how do you produce uh, uh, robust public policies for the benefit of people. So um, with that said, I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, to know what uh, goals you have in mind uh, for uh, the technology section of the magazine and I welcome uh, uh, new ideas from you. Yeah, well, um, you know, if I were to state one large overreaching goal, I would say that in the press, Articles that have evolutionary content in them are typically focused on biology or um, more traditional fields. And I feel like there's a lot of exciting stuff going on at the intersection of evolution and technology. And I feel like it's not getting nearly enough attention. So I w I'd want, I think, um, you know, we really need to provide an outlet for the public to be able to interact with the uh, community of people that are working in this intersection. That's right. A lot of times, I think maybe it's it's people um, aren't taking the time to make their material accessible, or maybe mm -hmm. they they feel like they're they're too busy, or maybe they simply aren't being approached by by uh, mainstream media outlets. Um, but I feel like we can become the face of evolution and technology to the public, and and uh, I think we can we can become a major player in that uh, in that space. Well, that's uh, wonderful, and uh, uh, thanks for your enthusiasm. And do uh, you have any uh, particular themes in mind that uh, you may wish to begin covering uh, for the magazine sometime in the near future? This this July, actually, I'll be going to the Gecko Conference. That's the Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference in Philadelphia. 
And uh, that is a particularly vibrant community of people working in a field called evolutionary computation, which is an example of an area where people have taken evolution and have used it for their own purpose in developing technology. So uh, some of the things I expect to see there are people that use evolution to design robots. You know, it's called evolutionary robotics. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's going to be a lot of people that, that work in a field called evolutionary algorithms, which is using the evolutionary process to do things on the computer automatically that you otherwise maybe wouldn't be able to do on your own. Kind of related to that, but not at the conference, is my own work, the electronic brainstorming applications, uh, which is another field that fits in with that idea of evolution being used for a technological tool that's being developed. Mm -hmm. So that's one area. Another theme I want to look at is, you know, how how t technology is being used, on the other hand, to, to try to understand evolution. So we have people that are taking simple models of evolution and implementing them on the computer, uh, simulating these models to try to study various parts of evolution, you know, trying to study, for example, how altruism came to be. It's something called agent-based modeling, and what you mm -hmm. do is you basically take these uh, simple agents, which are kind of like miniature programs that act in very simple ways and respond to simple rules, and you let them interact with each other and then you look at the big picture and see what emerges from those simple interactions. And oftentimes, if those agents can, can change and evolve over time, uh, you can get things like altruism coming out of them. And that, that way you can try to find what the smallest set of assumptions will lead to something like the emergence of altruism. You know, there's plenty of other questions you can explore with agent-based modeling and artificial life studies. There's also a lot of stuff going on in the field of ecology with people using technology to simulate different ecological scenarios. Um, mm -hmm. Then, of course, there's there's people that use technology to gather uh, real-world data. I, I just heard about a study where using some electronic wireless system to track how birds move around and how they interact with each other, and that way they can reconstruct their social network. And it's actually quite elaborate and quite fascinating, and I think quite relevant to evolutionary studies since social interaction has been linked with uh, with the evolution of bigger brains. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it, uh, I, I do, uh, I'm increasingly beginning to believe that uh, evolution can st shed light uh, on uh, how, on the evolution of technology itself. I mean, you look at it, uh, there are a variety of technologies that are produced by standardized processes. And then there are technologies that emerge, or call it improvisation. And um, how does uh, evolution, um, um, evolutionary framework, uh, help us understand uh, uh, the standardization and improvisation of technologies, and how it uh, affects the broader social culture is an important uh, uh, element uh, for us to uh, think about. You look at uh, how uh, new technology has uh, is uh, is exploding. Uh, in terms of uh, newer manifestations and uh, designs and whatnot. But sometimes it makes me wonder. I mean, some of the basic um, uh, elements of uh, these technologies have remained the same or have remained constant over time. For example, the, uh, you look at LED bulbs um, and you look at the shape of them, they're pretty much, if you look at a, uh, uh, on a smaller scale, they still retain the shape of the the prototype that Edison uh, built um, almost yeah. a century ago. Or you look at the keyboard or the monitor, but the basic platform uh, remains the same. And uh, I think that there's um, uh, you know uh, a pathway uh, to um, uh, that we can open in terms of explaining this or um, or perhaps uh, uh, inviting readers to think about uh, these topics. So I think that's an opportunity that we have uh, for this uh, section, and I'm uh, delighted that uh, you're uh, joining us. Um, so, uh, do you have any other ideas or um, uh, other topics that you that's burning in your mind? <laughs> yeah, just to go along those lines of of uh, you know technology and and uh, and and policy. Um, you know, I think we can all agree that that technological innovation is is a good thing. 
And uh, in, in evolutionary terms, we can think about things such as evolvability. Mm-hmm. You know, just as before when I was talking about the evolution of ideas and groups, you know, we want to, to maintain the evolvability of ideas to, so that we can keep coming up with new ideas. I think the same thing applies at, at the social level, at the society level, when it comes to the evolution of technology, is we need to understand the the landscape, the environment um, within which technology is evolving because we want to maintain an evolvable environment for technology. You know, um, you know, for example, um, uh, just hypothetically, if you were to to close uh, your communications completely, say, um, mm-hmm. and and uh, you know, a, a suppose further that you divided up your your country into small compartments that didn't communicate with each other, um, what would that do to the evolution of technology? Um, what, what it, it might make it so that um, uh, the crossbreeding of different technologies would not happen as often, and uh, you might get some uh, divergence in, in how technology plays out in each of these different compartments. Um, that This is uh, an emerging field, and I'm, I don't know too much about it yet, uh, but I think it's something that really should be explored because I think it's it's very important that we try to maintain an evolvable environment for technology to continue to evolve. Very good. Well, uh, I'm delighted that uh, you're uh, going to be the short editor for the technology section. And uh, I uh, thank all the listeners uh, today. Uh, and uh, please join me again in welcoming Benjamin uh, Bush uh, to Evolution, This View of Life. And until next time, this is uh, Guru Madhavan uh, for Evolution, This View of Life, a magazine that approaches anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective. Thank you, everybody. Um, Good night. All right. (laughs)